morning. Welcome once again to Charleswood Community Church Online. Today is the first Sunday of July, and so, as is our habit here at Charleswood, we'll be taking some time later on during the service to remember the saving sacrifice of Jesus by receiving communion. If you haven't already gathered some bread and some juice for yourself and your family, feel free to pause the video and go grab it so that you're ready when we are. This past week I was chatting with a friend and had a memory come to mind, one that I actually think of fairly often. I remembered a communion service at Charleswood a number of years ago where our dear friend Rod Meineker shared from Hebrews chapter 10 verse 32 where it says, Remember those earlier days after you had received the light. In the New Living Translation it says it this way, Think back on those early days when you first learned about Christ. Rod asks us that day to look back and even try to put ourselves back in the moment with all the thoughts and feelings that came when our eyes were open to who Christ is and what he had done, that day that we received the free gift of salvation. That brief thought really does often come to mind, especially when approaching a time of remembrance. I'm, re I'm reminded again to look back at the work of our Lord on the cross and intentionally remember my life before Christ or what it might have been without him, and then look at my life with Christ, keeping in step with the Holy Spirit. Are you thinking of your own story now? I hope so, and I hope and I pray that it fills you with great joy and gratitude. Telling the gospel story again and again will always put our lives in proper order, and we look forward to hearing more about that as Gavin begins our new sermon series today called Starting Point. So as thoughts of the day you met Jesus are still rolling around in your mind, we're going to begin by singing a great hymn, Oh, What a Wonderful, Wonderful Day. This is one of the first hymns I ever learned to play for church, and it's still an uplifting and praise-filled song to sing today. So why don't we sing together? Surely endure after 
to the Father except through me. And in that one statement, Jesus pointed out that he is the sole and the only path to hope and the security that we have for today 
and for eternity. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all. Thanks for joining me. Well, this past week was Canada Day. 153 years ago, on July 1st, 1867, the British Parliament signed into law the British North America Act, and the country, the Dominion of Canada, was born. And this Canada Day was a little different. No fireworks, COVID has changed things up in our culture somewhat. And not only that, but I noticed on my social media a uh, hashtag that was going around as well, Cancel Canada Day. There's this, this groundswell of protest. There's a lot of questioning these days about Canada, the country, and our culture. Do the old stories, do the old understandings of, of our culture, of, of our nation, of us as a people, do they still work? Are they true? Do they matter? And so a lot of that is going on. And so as, as I was thinking about that, 
and thinking about what I wanted to do for this summer, I think what I want to do is take advantage of, of that, that moment that we're in right now, this kind of cultural reevaluation. And I want to talk about starting points, what it means to go back to and to set our hearts and minds on the gospel of Jesus Christ as we find it proclaimed and announced in the opening chapter of Mark's gospel. What does it mean in this particular moment as there's all kinds of cultural unrest and, and, and questions being asked? And that's a good time to ask, what does it mean in this particular moment to be a follower of Jesus, to proclaim and live out God's kingdom, identity, and values? And today, we're also going to celebrate communion as followers of Jesus as well. So a very appropriate time to, to ask the question, what is the beginning of the good news? And that's how Mark starts off his chapter. And for these nine weeks in our series, uh, we're going to be going through Mark's opening chapter, 45 verses. So we're going to slow down a little bit. And we're going to just take just a few verses per week, and we're going to really dig down into what the good news actually is and what it means for us today and what it meant back then as well. The beginning of the good news of Jesus, Mark chapter 1, the opening three verses. The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Well, archaeologists in the 1800s discovered in western Turkey an ancient Greek city called Preen. And as they were scooping down through the layers and the strata of walls and buildings, they came across a calendar, a calendar. And this was interesting because uh, Julius Caesar in 45 BC had completely remade how ancient peoples told time. And, and across the Roman Empire, which was basically the known world at the time, uh, what he did was say, we're going to have a new way of marking time and, and framing history as well. The Julian calendar was born. And so the month of what we call July was, was Quintilis. And he renamed it July after himself, uh, Julius. And so that was, that was a completely remaking of time. The, this calendar that the archaeologists found can be dated to about 9 BC, and it's uh, Julius Caesar's successor, Caesar Augustus, who was Julius's uh, adopted son. And so what, Julius, uh, what Caesar Augustus uh, did was, in fact, make this all about himself, as emperors are wont to do. And, in fact, he said, it isn't just enough, the Julian calendar is all well and good, but time starts with me. And so if Julius can have his own month, July, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the month of August. And so August is named after Caesar Augustus. So it used to be Sextilis, and now it's August. So you and I, July and August, we're still marked and shaped by those understandings, even though we've switched to the Gregorian calendar. Interesting. Uh, what this also does, besides an interesting little tidbit about where we get July and August from and, and where the origins of the Julian calendar are from, and yes, it's a nice little insight into Roman culture, but it shows us very closely and very, and very well what the, what the logic of empire is all about. Because on this calendar inscription was, was the reason, the whole understanding, the whole Roman understanding, of what time was and who was responsible for time and what time was pointing toward. So this isn't just a, a little bit of uh, dating. It's, it's more about this whole cultural understanding of what life and time and history are all about. It was a gospel. Literally, in, in, in Roman culture, a gospel it wasn't a religious word, it was a political word. It just meant good news about or from the emperor. 
good news about the emperor. And so this is literally a gospel of the emperor. This is the gospel of empire. Since providence, which has ordered all things and is deeply interested in our life, has set in most perfect order by giving us Augustus, who she filled with virtue that he might benefit mankind, sending him as a savior, both for us and our descendants, that he might end war and arrange all things. And since he, Caesar, by his appearance, excelled even our anticipations, surpassing all previous benefactors, and not even leaving to posterity any hope of surpassing what he has done. And since the birthday of the god August, Augustus was the beginning of the good tidings, the gospel, for the world that came by reason of him. Everything springs from Augustus. Everything is for Augustus, the most excellent one, the savior of the world. It's fascinating too. This, this Pax Romana, this, the, the peace of Rome that was, that was started by Julius Caesar and achieved by Caesar Augustus, the one that, that conquered the, the entire known world, was peace and prosperity or else, right? The Pax Romana was, was achieved by a mountain of dead bodies, of conquered peoples, and of course, slave labor. And what did they achieve? technology, infrastructure, trade, prosperity for a very few, and entertainment for lots of people, right? Does that sound familiar? Sounds a little familiar to me. The gospel of the empire is peace and salvation, or else. So this is interesting. The gospel, and, and we hear that word today, we hear a religious word, we hear a churchy kind of word, and we, we think, oh, that has to do with, uh, you know, maybe, it's about Jesus. Maybe it's, it's, it's something that, that church, and it doesn't really have anything to do with the rest of life. Well, that's not at all what Mark meant. When Mark talks about the beginning of the good news, the beginning of the gospel, what he's talking about is an announced political and cultural and religious message. There was no such thing as separation of church and state uh, like the we live with now. The separation of church and state that, that we live with, that's really good because it, it, it keeps religion from being co-opted by the state. And, and we see that so many times uh, throughout human history. But one of the downsides of, of how we experience the gospel as, as separated from church and state is because particularly in Canadian culture, we see it as your religion, your, your faith, the gospel, is something private, is something that, that's kept away from the public square, is kept away from your public life. You don't talk about it. Polite people don't talk about religion. Um, and in Canada, it's become irrelevant because it's just a private little matter. There have been uh, a number of Canadian prime ministers who have said, oh, no, 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 I'm, I'm a good churchgoer. I'm a Christian, but I don't let my faith affect how I govern, or I don't let my faith affect how I do my job. It's a, kind of a fascinating thing if you think about it. You think, wait a sec, something that is supposed to form absolutely the deepest part of who you are, supposed to give you your value system, that has nothing to do with how you, you carry out your job, how you decide matters of justice and life and death for millions of people. The Christian faith has nothing to do with that. Hmm. Well, let me suggest this, friends. The gospel, or should I say a gospel, will always change you. A gospel, a way of thinking and believing about yourself and the world, how, how reality, how time, how history is shaped, some kind of gospel is going to change you, will shape you. And if the gospel of Jesus is not shaping you, then there's, there's a different gospel that's affecting you and forming you. Because a gospel affects all parts of your life and will shape you. The gospel of Jesus must change you or something, some other gospel is changing you. Well, how does the gospel of Jesus awaken us? 
And this is how the Gospel of Mark, this, this announcement uh, of the good news starts off. But he doesn't give us too much of the backstory. He doesn't give us a birth uh, story at all. He just says, boom, this is the beginning of the good news. And he just gets right into it because he's very interested in the cross. What separates this good news of Jesus from the good news of Caesar, the good news of other cultures? He says, no, no, it's the cross and the resurrection, and I want to tell you about Jesus. And so he gets right into it. Friends, as I was reading over Mark chapter 1, I was struck by how the, the things of that culture, the people, the things that the people were yearning for, are the same things that Canadians today are yearning for. I think of, I see things like freedom and security, significance, justice, and peace. All the things that Canadians say are, are, are important and, and we're yearning for, those are the same things that people 2,000 years ago were yearning for as well. And here's Mark saying, listen, here's the beginning of the good news of Jesus that can really deliver that for you. And so how does the gospel of Jesus awaken us to that good news? news. Well, first of all, all of us are challenged to make a choice of allegiance. All of us are challenged to make an important choice, and that is allegiance. So what is allegiance? Allegiance is simply this. It's the tie that binds sovereign and subject. Allegiance means true and faithful service. The root of that word is an old French word. It means liege. It means who's your lord? Who do you serve? And it was, came, came from that feudal system where if you were a peasant or, or a serf, uh, you served uh, a lord, you served a master. And the question of allegiance pushes us to, to ask, who do you serve? Who is your lord? And well, Canadians, well, we, we hear that and we go, oh, well, wait a sec, I, you know, there, there's, I have a few bosses, I, I, I can serve several masters at a time, but typically we as Canadians say, no, I, I am my own master. I serve myself. I'm the one who calls the shots, right? And so here is the, the offense of the gospel of Jesus, because here's what the Bible says. The Bible says, you and me, we are born slaves. We're born slaves. We are captive to sin. And not only that, but we participate in our own captivity. Well, for Canadians, that's pretty offensive because the high values of our culture are what? Choice and freedom. And the gospel comes along and says, you have no choice. You have no freedom because you're a captive. And in fact, you're blinded by your own ignorance. That's a pretty offensive announcement, isn't it, for Canadians? 2,000 years ago, the, the offensive part of the gospel was, uh, was Jesus announcing that, that uh, here were these people who thought they were religious insiders were in fact illegitimate. And they were not sons and daughters of Abraham, but in fact they, they followed the devil because they didn't recognize Jesus. And so it's interesting how the gospel just finds the soft point in each culture and just presses on it and challenges some of the sacred cows of each cultural group. For Canadians, I think it's, it's choice and freedom. I don't answer to anybody. I'm completely free. No, the gospel says, you are a slave. The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah. And why is this word so important? Messiah literally meant anointed one. It literally meant uh, here was somebody who had been anointed by God to deliver, to bring about delivery. And throughout the Old Testament, this phrase uh, Messiah uh, meant uh, someone who was going to be the harbinger, someone who was going to be the, who delivered that God's long-awaited victory over evil. The Messiah in the Old Testament was somebody who was going to be descended from David, he was going to unify the tribes of Israel. He was going to re rebuild and restore the temple. And he was going to usher in this new age of global peace, of global shalom. And he was going to bring about God's victory over evil. He was going to right all the wrongs and boot out all the foreign oppressors. And he was going to restore 
truth and justice and righteousness. Well, that sounds great, doesn't it? And there was confusion when Jesus shows up because people can't quite wrap their heads around. Well, is, is this really the Messiah? And in, in Mark chapter 8, Jesus is talking to his disciples and he says, uh, who do people say I am? And the disciples kind of scratch their heads and, and, and they report that cultural confusion. They say, well, some people say you're John the Baptist and some people say you're Elijah and other people say you're a prophet. And Jesus says, okay, who do you say I am? And Peter, Peter says, you are the Messiah. You're the, you're the anointed one. You're the deliverer. You're the one who's going to bring about God's rule. And that confusion in their culture. We can understand that as we look at it from 2,000 year history. We can see that they were politically occupied by the Romans. They were economically oppressed. Everybody was living in poverty except for a few collaborators. They were culturally dominated by Rome and they were yearning for freedom. They were yearning for somebody to throw off the yoke of this foreign oppression. And Jesus comes along and says, I am the Messiah. I'm the one who's going to usher in God's kingdom. And they were looking for a specific type of deliverer. And, they, and so you can see why. Well, is, this, is this really the Messiah? Is this really the rescuer of Israel? Is this really the one to whom our scriptures pointed? And all of us are challenged, just as they were 2,000 years ago, to make a choice. Is Jesus really the Messiah? Is he really the one who's going to bring God's kingdom in? Yes or no? And there's no room to sit on the fence. Well, secondly, besides the fact we're challenged to make a choice, following Jesus involves more than just intellectual agreement. It's not just an opinion. Here's a, a Roman coin, and it has the, uh, the likeness of Caesar Augustus on it, and there's, there's a phrase on the back of it. It's not in God we trust or anything like that. It's, it's divi filius. In Latin, it means son of the God, son of the God. Roman culture, Roman religion, remember there's no, there's no uh, div division between politics and religion and culture. It's all the same thing. To be a good Roman meant you had to worship the emperor. There was no ifs and, and buts about it. And Roman religion was incredibly accommodating to all the other religions that they had conquered. They took over all the Greek gods, and, and uh, so Zeus became Jupiter. And when they moved into different cultures, they conquered Egypt and Isis. Sure, she's a goddess too, throw her in. And whatever religion they encountered, they just incorporated into their pantheon. It's a pantheistic religion. There's lots of gods. So they just incorporated all these gods into their big pantheon of, of gods and goddesses and semi-gods and divine people. And the mystery religions with Mithra, sure, throw him in. Caesar Augustus, sure, he's another god. Put him in, in, in there too. And so when they come up against this, this monotheism of Judaism, the Jewish, there's one God. Well, what do they do with that? Well, because Judaism was at the very far end of the empire, uh, almost out of the empire's reach, they, they made a kind of an accommodation with Judaism. They said, well, you know, we're gonna let that go as long as you stay quiet and, and be private and be irrelevant. As long as you be quiet about it, We'll let you have your temple. You pay your taxes though, and that was the big thing. As long as you pay your taxes, as long as the money keeps flowing to Rome, we'll kind of let that go. You don't have to worship Caesar like everybody else does. And so here, here comes Jesus. Here comes Jesus, and, and he is a threat to that. What was the big reason that he was crucified? And the, the Jewish high priest says, what? Better that one man die than the whole country goes up in flames. He's a threat to this, this uneasy alliance that we've made with Rome. Jesus is a threat because he's demanding the whole allegiance, economically, politically, everything. He's demanding, well, you don't serve Caesar anymore. You serve God. Well, that was a big problem. You don't threaten Roman power. And... What about our culture? 
And it's interesting how our culture is very, like Rome, very accommodationist, isn't it? And they say, oh, you can believe whatever you like. You can, you can be a Christian, you can be this, you can be that, sure, no problem. But as soon as you threaten the, the sacred cows, the, the powers, the, what's really important in our culture, then the pushback starts. What are the, some of the things in our culture that, that the Christian gospel threatens? Well, how about identity? How about the exclusive nature of Christianity? Jesus says, I am the way, the way, only one. There's only one way to God, not a whole bunch of ways. And people find that very offensive. How about the Christian ethic of sexuality? That's another thing that people are reacting strongly against. Well, you, you can't have a, a Christian college uh, and, and tell people how to live and tell people who they can sleep with or, or, or whatnot. And so there's, there's interesting how people really react against that. The commitment to truth. Christians say, well, there is such a thing as objective truth. Um, and so it's interesting. All these, these ideas, again, and how it threatens our culture. And our culture would say, well, you can believe whatever you like until some of these things are threatened. And following Jesus is not simply just an idea or an opinion or something like you put on and take off like, like a coat, but it's something that commands your primary allegiance and forms your very identity. And it's determinative of who you are and how you live not simply just uh, an elastic opinion that, that bends and stretches to shape your culture. The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. And here's this, this Mark's theme over and over again in his gospel, in his, in his announcement of the good news. The scandal of Jesus' crucifixion. So what changes this story from being just the scandalous death of a common criminal? And remember, Rome crucified tens of thousands of people in that time. So what was one more? Well, it was the fact that Jesus claimed to be the Son of God, claimed to be divine, claimed to be the representative of God doing something, dying a, a, a death that was a ransom for many. In uh, Mark chapter 14 and verse 61, and here's this, this climactic scene in Jesus' trial. And this really gets at the very heart of, of what Jesus is claiming to do and, and to be. And so here's uh, in, in verse 61, Jesus remains silent, gives no answer. And again, the high priest asked him, are you the Messiah, the Son of of the Blessed One. And they know exactly what they're talking about. Are you the Anointed One, the Deliverer, the Son of the Most High God? Are you claiming that? And what does Jesus say? He says, I am. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. The Messiah, the Son of God, the Son of Man, all these loaded phrases, Jesus wraps them all up and says, it's me. That's who I am. I'm the Messiah. I'm the Son of God. I'm the Son of Man. And how do they react? The high priest tore his clothes. Why do we need any more witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? You have heard the blasphemy. Listen, the high priest and all the Jewish leaders, they did not think that Jesus was just a good teacher. They did not think that he was a good guy. Uh, dispensing these truisms and cultural little uh, wonderful sayings. They did not think he was a radical revolutionary. They knew what he was claiming to be, the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who burst all the categories, the one who demands all their allegiance. Following Jesus isn't just about agreement. It's about the whole commitment, life and body. Well, lastly, only Jesus can truly satisfy our yearnings for restoration. August 28th, 1963, Martin Luther King, a Baptist preacher, spoke at the March on Washington. And there was a quarter of a million people at the Lincoln Memorial. 
um, and he gave his famous I have a dream speech and it was a very pedestrian speech and uh, he was losing the crowd and, and somebody of course Mahalia Jackson the gospel singer yells out tell him about the dream Martin and, and Martin Luther King quotes from Isaiah 40 and talks about this this wonderful quote about about what salvation is about the restoration of justice and peace and his vision of that and the I have a dream speech is one of the great speeches of, of oratory in the 20th century and it's the same words that Mark quotes too isn't it it's the same words I love this how how this whole notion of what true justice is is rooted in the gospel of God Gos the gospel the good news of Jesus and so folks we're living in this, this strange time we're living in this time of unrest and, and cultural protests and demonstrations and I want to suggest that what's what's driving it what's driving a lot of it is good people have this 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 thirst for justice and they want to see an end to injustice they want to see a, a, a stop to discrimination and systemic sin and these are all good things folks have a desire for peace and they want to see what's fair and right and this is a very good thing sadly what human history tells us is that we never get it right because all of us are, are wired wrongly the Bible calls it sin and so we always overcorrect. We overreact. The pendulum swings the other way. The oppressed becomes the oppressor. And the cycle of blame and violence just continues on and on. What the gospel of Jesus tells us is that ultimately there's no economic or political or cultural solution without addressing the real deep roots of the problem and that is sin anything where we find our purpose and our satisfaction apart from God that's what sin is folks finding our purpose and our satisfaction in anything apart from God and here's the gospel that comes and says listen you desire peace you desire justice you desire righteousness a right way of being and doing in culture that's good that's a God-given desire but only the only solution that's holistic that is fundamental that is powerful enough to solve this problem is the gospel of Jesus and here's uh, Mark as he's talking about the beginning of the good news and he roots it back in the Old Testament he says I'll send a messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way a voice of one calling in the wilderness and he starts off and those those that whole saying is three verses that are put together three parts one from Exodus one from Malachi and one from Isaiah 40 and he's putting them all together this is the message that, that, that God has unfolded throughout your history, God's people. And it's in the Torah, it's in the prophets, it's in the writings, and, and all throughout the Old Testament, what we would call the Old Testament, the Tanakh. Uh, it, here it is. This is what it is. This is what salvation is. This is God's plan all along. Listen, there's going to be uh, various messengers, various prophets, various preparations pointing to the deliverer pointing to, to the one who's going to come and the Isaiah 40 quote is so powerful because it talks about it brings up all these associations and, and Mark's readers would, would get that right away our, our history of wandering in the wilderness the Exodus the most important theme in the Old Testament that that delivery out of captivity and into the promised land and, and God's promises coming and the, the kingdom of God being right there and here's what Mark is saying folks the promise is now God's kingdom is here and God has delivered only the gospel of Jesus can satisfy our universal need and yearning for restoration and so folks I want to leave us with a starting point challenge in these wilderness days in these COVID days as we're emerging out of the wilderness it's good to take stock and good to think how can we prepare the way for the Lord well culturally 
we're, we are reevaluating the old stories of Canada, the, the ways that we are as a nation, the ways we are as a people. Who gets to belong? What does belonging mean? Where is justice? How can we achieve a more just culture and society? Those are good things to work towards. And so for followers of Jesus, this is an amazing moment. What a great opportunity to put forward the, the gospel of Jesus. And not only that, but to ask ourselves, what gospel have I been believing in? If the gospel of Jesus hasn't changed me fundamentally in all areas of my life, what other gospel have I believed in and has kind of crept in and taken away my affections? Folks, we all know the Canadian gospel is this idea of wealth, expertise, power, and pleasure. That's the gospel that our friends, our neighbors, and maybe even some Christians are operating with. Instead, Mark is challenging us. There's a, there's a good news of Jesus, and it's a different kind of gospel, and it's a, it's a, it's a challenge to the empire. It's a challenge to our selfish nature. It's a challenge to the, the whole categories of, of sin that we set up. So like John the Baptist, how can we point others who are searching to the one and the only solution that can truly satisfy? So let the beginnings of the good news of Jesus be your starting point this week. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for the gospel, this announcing of the good news of Jesus, which challenges us and asks us to give up control and authority in our own life and give it to God. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, friends, let's take our cue from Scripture and be not just hearers of the word, but doers as well. It's not enough just to hear the gospel. We need to understand it and live it out. And so one of the ways that we do that is to celebrate communion on a regular basis. We get to enjoy and celebrate and remember the death and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as he commanded us to do. And so today we're going to do it in a way that we've done it before um, during these quarantine times. Uh, we're going to, Gavin's going to read a scripture. And then before we take the bread and the, the cup separately, there's going to be a prayer that comes up on your screen. And we invite you and encourage you to read that prayer out loud. If you're with your family, maybe you want to choose someone to read it out loud. And if you're by yourself, I invite you to still read it out loud. There's power in the audible um, spoken word. And so, um, you know, just in your own timing, in the next few moments of quiet, we invite you to participate with us. So we started a new series in Mark chapter 1, and so we're going to stay in Mark's gospel in Mark chapter 14. And here's this description of, uh, of the Last Supper. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said to, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it, this is my body. together the body of Jesus broken for us.
continue in, in uh, Mark's Gospel, chapter 14. Then Jesus took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, he said to them. Truly I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it anew in the kingdom of God. Why don't we share the cup, the blood of Jesus, shed for you. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the gospel, the good news that announces by the death and resurrection of Jesus, that sin and death have been conquered and that we have been set free. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Thanks for being with us this week. God bless you this week.